um, in these ongoing debates on things like you know, raising the minimum wage, either at the federal level or state level, immigration policies, uh, and so on. And even if it's not conclusions, then approaches to to the issues. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think, for instance, in the, in the in the area of the minimum wage, there's been just an enormous amount of research uh, in the last 25 years um, following the work that that, that I did uh, with Alan Kruger, um, and not just in the United States, but in other countries. And I think um, reevaluating that evidence and thinking about it carefully and, and um, evaluating the whole thing from a more scientific view, not from an ideological point of view, I think is, is helpful um, and, and could be useful. But I, I'm not particularly optimistic that uh, views on topics like the minimum wage or immigration the simple kinds of things that economists bring to, to the table and the, the kinds of knowledge that we can bring are not necessarily the whole story. Um, you know, fundamentally, if minimum wages go up, even if there's no employment effect, it's still the case that employers have lower profits. And so employers may say, well, we need our profits. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a fundamental trade off between workers' wages and employers' profits. And, that isn't really something an economist can, uh, we can say what the trade-off is, but we can't really say which way you should come down on that trade-off. Um, David, I have another question for you. Um, so in economics, like many fields is, is a constantly evolving. Um, how do you see the field of economics evolving in the years ahead? And where should today's students and early career faculty um, try to push the field? Well, the field is becoming much more empirical. Um, when I was a graduate student, I would say seven eighths of the coursework and the concentration was on um, um, theoretical ideas and methodologies. And, and these days, um, most of the active research is, is on the applied side. And that's been made possible by uh, things like uh, the availability of um, massive, sometimes virtually the entire universe of data for a, a given topic. Like you can now get access to the tax records for all the workers in many countries. Uh, and allows you to follow workers as they move between jobs and allows you to address questions that were really inconceivable um, 20 years ago even. And so definitely there's going to be more empirical work. Um, related to that uh, is this, um, one can see very easily if one looks at uh, what people are doing, the, the rise in large team projects that often involve many, many researchers over many, many hours with uh, teams of undergraduates and graduates as assistants and then assistant professors and maybe some full professors, much more like you would see in a, in a large um, science lab uh, where there's a, a long stream of effort required to get a project going and then it, it requires many, many bodies. So that's, that's happening in economics and it, it means that people have to carefully think about uh, what team they want to join. <laughs> how they're going to develop experience in many different aspects of the field, maybe move between teams, much more the kind of um, careers I think that you see in, um, in the natural sciences. A uh, kind of a related question um, from a different colleague of mine. Um, well, why did uh, your colleagues in the 1990s uh, find your work questionable and how has the field kind of evolved to, uh, to understand it a little bit better? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, economics uh, historically is it was an um, introspective field. So someone would develop a set of hypotheses from introspection about the way that things worked. And it's oftentimes when people are developing introspective models of the world, they get mistaken between what they, you know, what could be true and what they wish was true or what they think should be true. So it often inadvertently starts, their, their theorizing starts to pick up um, kind of a, one could think of it as an ideological bias, which comes about from the, the set of particular simplifications they want to make. 
um, for their theory versus another theory. And, and anyway, the, the reigning theory of the way labor markets worked in um, up until fairly recently, um, and, it, and to some extent even today, says that uh, a given employer has no, um, no discretion in what wage they set. Each individual worker essentially faces a market wage and the employer simply says, oh, I want to hire that person. I'll pay them this wage. That's what they required in the market. I want to hire that person. Uh, that's what they'll pay. Now, in the other fields of economics, for instance, the field of economics that studies um, pricing of gasoline or pricing of groceries, they no longer think like that. They haven't thought like that for 30 years. But the labor economists, um, being kind of of a conservative bent, a small c conservative bent, wanted to stick with kind of what you might think of as 1920s thinking in a way. And uh, so our results really make a lot of sense. Our, my findings on the minimum wage, for instance, uh, and to some extent also in, in, on immigration make much more sense in this world where employers have a lot of discretion and what wage they set. They, they don't make much sense um, in this old fashioned view. And so the reluctance of people to give up on that old fashioned view really said that, uh, well, as a, an old friend of mine said, my first co-author was a a person named John About, who's now the chief uh, economist at the Census Bureau. And John once uh, said at the end of a seminar, well, once again, the, um, the theory has tested the data and found the data wanting. So they were, they were thinking about it along those lines. Professor Card, was this ever a prize that you imagined you'd receive? And now that you have it, what do you do for an encore? Uh, no, I, no, I, I would, I, I don't think, um, I don't, normally the Nobel Prize, in, the, the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics is awarded for methodological innovations, at least in the past. And so someone like me who really um, doesn't do pure methodological research, but does um, substantive research, um, would not normally be someone that would be um, even <laughs> any presumption that that kind of work would be something that the, the field would recognize uh, with the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, I suppose I, I, I've got um, quite a few papers that are overdue. I, I have um, a, a, a table I've been working on uh, uh, the last couple of nights, and I'll be working on that table probably as soon as I get some sleep. <laughs> Thank you. Kara, any other questions? Uh, no other questions at the moment. Okay. Having said that, then why don't we, uh, for the next couple of minutes at least, uh, Professor Card, if there are any sort of closing statements or comments that you'd like to make, that would be fantastic. I'll leave the floor to you. Um. Well, I'd, I, as I said at the beginning, I'd like to, to again reiterate that uh, you know my um, my to the extent that my career has been successful, it, it's really building on the on the contributions of so many people. Um, uh, starting with my wife, who's been tolerant of long hours and many absences and uh, many forgotten events uh, on my part. Um, all of my teachers and all of my and, and also also all of my colleagues and uh, co-authors who uh, and graduate students who've really been a, a source of inspiration and um, to me so I, I I guess I would end with that thanking them all for all the great help that they provided me over the years. All right, thank you. Uh, well, on behalf of a Chancellor Carol Christ, uh, Dean of Social Sciences Rocca Ray, Chair of Department of Economics. Sakar Kareev, my colleague Kara Menke, and of course our honoree David Card. I am Roque Montez, and I thank you all for being with us uh, this morning. And once again, David Card, congratulations to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. All right, we're clear. Wonderful, wonderful job, everybody. Thank you so much for, for getting up again early this morning and hanging in with us. And it, it looks like, Airdrie, that everything went pretty smoothly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked really good. We had about 20, 25 reporters on the call, uh, quiet reporters. Um, maybe they weren't quite up yet. Um, 
but this is fantastic. I would imagine, Professor Carr, that you'll be hearing from some others as the day progresses and, and Ed Limpinen and others on my team will certainly be facilitating and fielding those your way and, and certainly you respond as you, as you see fit, sir. Um, okay. Yep. Thank yep. you. All right, no, thank you, thank you. All right. Get some okay. sleep, David. Yes, good, good advice. <laughs> thank you, David. Congratulations <laughs> again. And I do hope you get some sleep. Um, I read somewhere in an interview that you gave that you became an academic because it was okay, it allowed you to wake up late. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, I had to um, uh, milk cows. Wow. <laughs> yeah. uh, my, my dad always started at, at uh, quarter past five in the morning. Okay. <laughs> That's very, very funny. Almost, almost any job looks good. <laughs> Okay. Congratulations again. I hope yes, you have a wonderful day and we'll be back in touch. All right. Congratulations. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Congrats. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Yep. Bye. Okay, we did it. Hey. It stopped, I think. Yeah, yeah we're. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. So now, what is your plan? Will you be going to your office, to your department? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was, um, 